Welcome back in. We are The Meltdown. Thrilled to have you here for yet another 2024 movie review. This time it is one of the year's biggest, definitely one of the year's biggest budgets for sure. And that is the sequel to the 2000 blockbuster Oscar award winning smash hit Gladiator as we are reviewing Gladiator 2. This time with a lot of fresh faces, one fresh face here in Meltdown 2.0 that is lance taylor who's joining us yet again here in studio the culver studio lance appreciate you making time for us i know you're a huge fan of the original gladiator i am i remember going to see it you guys this is before your time there was a theater at brook highland there is a sprouts there now and there was a theater that's the one i remember what i ate before and i went and saw it with my buddy brett harden and and i was just blown away i mean um just that first battle scene. And I thought Ridley Scott did a really good job, you know, having a, a massive battle scene this time on water uh, to kind of kick off the movie. But yeah, I was a huge fan of the first one. Um, I haven't been with you guys. I appreciate you having me since we did trivia forever ago, it seems like. <laughs> that is correct. And and I remember kind of in the off season, this is probably early summer, spring, where you were like, we're going to be previewing these movies. What jumps to you? And I was like, Gladiator 2. Yeah. Uh, Cause I remember hearing two years ago that Denzel was going to be cast in this and there was going to be elephants and rhinoceroses and I didn't know what to think. And I didn't know what his role was going to be. I, I want to get to one of your main gripes here first. Once again, Tim Melton, Tyler Johns with Lance Taylor, as we are going to talk about your frustration with the sharks in the movie, because it's been kind of circulating here in the back room, talking about how you weren't into the sharks being there in the Coliseum. Well, you know, okay. A couple of things. Um, I thought Ridley Scott, he tries to be somewhat historically accurate, at least with some of the storylines and how he presents like the hand to hand stuff. Um, Tyler was the first to clue us in when we would see these, these great water battle scenes in the Coliseum that those were actually historically accurate. Okay. We can roll with that. But when you start to put sharks in there twofold, why even include the sharks? There's a, a enough, uh, gore, uh, there's enough destruction and violence that we really didn't need the sharks. And then the other thing, for whatever reason, CGI can't get the shark right. Well, for me, it was the CGI baboon. And that was the frustrating oh. thing for me. I thought that really yeah. looked bad yeah. compared yeah. to a lot of the stuff we saw. Well, in I suddenly know and he's like, what kind of, what, what is that? And I was like, it's supposed to be a baboon, but I ain't never seen a baboon like that. No. It's almost like, and I know you guys are, I think you're fans of I Am Legend. Yeah. It's almost like that would be a baboon that had been flipped into one of those vampires. I mean, just completely like pale, like a, um, a, a what are they, skinwalkers? And those damn things were intense. All right. I want to start with this point. Tyler, I know you've talked about the absence of Russell Crowe. It feels like the entire world is talking about the absence of Russell Crowe in this film. Obviously, they allude to Russell Crowe and his character constantly throughout the course of the runtime. But in my opinion, the biggest gap that's missing, and I don't think this is a hot take, it's not Russell Crowe. It's Joaquin Phoenix. He has missed sorely Definitely. in this film, in my opinion. Do you yeah. agree with that assessment? I, I agree. I didn't think uh, Joseph Quinn and uh, the guy who plays Joseph Quinn's brother. Archinger. All right. As a as Geta and Caracol or something. Better if we don't go with the names. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's not use the, the names. The D-bags that played the emperor. But they were yes. the real emperors that actually took down the empire. They were the... The, the lasting guys that I mean, I thought they, they did. A, I thought Ridley Scott did a good job of casting what seemed to be creepy, incestuous, disease ridden guys. Yes. But did any of them hit the high notes of Joaquin no, Phoenix in nope, this movie? No, as nope. good as and, and we all remember as Maximus, Russell Crowe won an Academy Award for Best Actor. But the guy that stole that movie was Joaquin Phoenix as Commodus. My take on that, and I agree because there were a lot of flashbacks. I thought it was kind of cool how they did um, almost an animation. At the beginning, during the opening yeah. credits. And I you. think, and just my take on it is maybe Ridley Scott with a big weird personality of Joaquin Phoenix got a little sideways. Maybe. Maybe so. Uh, that, that could be the case. It is impressive, though, that director Ridley Scott, at the age of, what, 86 years old, Incredible. still going right now. He's going to do more Alien movies, it feels like, very soon. Ridley Scott, top five director for you? Uh, possibly. You know, the funny thing is, um, well, not funny, uh, I, you know, outside of Blade Runner and Alien, like, what are critically acclaimed? Like, I guess Gladiator is... But if you go back and you look at the Rotten Tomatoes meter, it's only got an 80%, which blows me away. Really? Yeah. 
the the audience scores on one and two are almost equivalent, eighty four to eighty seven. Which you know, I thought Gladiator one was was much better. I would give it you know an A plus. I would give this a B. You know, B plus. Lance, it's come out as a, a revelation, and I'm very proud of this, that you've come out now as a wrestling fan, retroactively, <laughs> yeah. of an era that you didn't live in. It just took me one documentary on Netflix. But, like, Gladiator in 2000 was sort of a carbon copy of the McMahon-Austin feud, but in a movie form. And the fact that you resonate so much with Gladiator already, and now you're starting to look at the McMahon-Austin era, and you're going, you know, there's something to that. There's a lot of parallels there between those two of what the audience will always get behind, which is everyday blue collar guy fighting against that sort of corporate monster. It's, That's exactly what you got in the 2000. Has it been analogized by other people like that? Or you just come up with that? Cause I think it's really interesting. No, it, it's definitely been okay. discussed. It's definitely been talked about. It's just wrestling did it first. And I'm glad that you're sort of retroactively paying respects to the wrestling industry because I do feel like a little bit of that angle is trying to be seized on here narratively in gladiator two, but it doesn't quite work for me story-wise. And I do feel like the second half of this movie, it is a Denzel vehicle. And I actually think that that weakens the movie, the coup and his quest for power. And while Denzel is an all timer and he's electric, I do feel like he becomes the main character of the story at a time where Gladiator never got away from Russell Crowe being the main character of that. Yeah, story. look, and I don't want to get away or give away too much, but after the film, and you know, you go with a couple of people, you discuss it. I went with it's girlfriends. Spoiler son. heavy, you can get into it. Well, I, I thought the ascension of Denzel was just, I mean, he shows up to Rome in a chariot wagon with, you know, whatever his right hand guy and a bunch of slaves, and then. 45 minutes later in the movie, he's almost ruling the entire country. He's the emperor, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And and I just thought the ascension of that character was a little ridiculous. I didn't mind Denzel. First time we've really seen him in that role since training day, be the really bad guy. Um, you know, Denzel going hand to hand with Paul Mescal, which I really didn't know what I was going to think about him in that role. I thought he pulled it off pretty well. I didn't like, you know, some of the um some of the equipment, we'll call it at the end of the the movie. I thought that was a little cheesy. Yeah. What when that was brought on, there were a couple of little, you know, moments like that that I thought were hokey. This thing loses steam throughout. I think it starts super strong. And then outside of the baboons, the the baboons was the first time I started selling stock on the movie while I'm watching it because I was all in. I'm like, this could be the movie of the year. And then it feels like it just loses so much steam. How do you think it did in terms of its job of connecting to the original? Because, well, I think they maybe tried to hold. I agree. Yeah. Like we've got to have this same. Um, w- when we look at the storyline, the plots basically have the same arc. And I didn't think you necessarily had to do that. And I thought they really, really forced Pedro Pascal, who, you know, at the beginning of the movie, you know, you, you thought he was going to be one character who ends up being a different character. Um, Connie Nielsen, by the way, I don't know how old she is. She's aged tremendously she for this role. Yes. That's so funny because, you know, son leans over. What kind of animal is that? Girlfriend on the other side leans over. She's got really good work done. Well, um, it and, worked out. And, and I and I agreed. I was like, yeah, I mean, she is she has aged gracefully. Uh, but I thought they forced that storyline, you know, too much. Like, oh my God, there's my son. And um, I don't know. There there were a lot of holes in this, but I think you said it originally, and I think Tyler agreed with you that going into this, it just seemed like a big big budget popcorn movie. So just for the entertainment value, if you love violence, you yeah. love gore, you love really good battle scenes. I mean, this thing had a lot more action, in my opinion, than than the first one. A lot of people consider the original Gladiator to be an all-timer. Anytime it's on, they have to sit down and watch it. They It doesn't matter what part of the movie it's in, they're going to watch that. I don't feel like you're going to get that same sort of connection with Gladiator 2. And Tyler, I think it's a lot because of the oversaturation of what Gladiator spawned. We got so many different swords and sandals type movies and television shows. We live in a Game of Thrones world now where Gladiator 2 almost feels a little bit old. Like there was that uh that uh, Spartacus show was on like a Cinemax or HBO. Rome was on HBO. Forever. Yes. I never watched Spartacus. I heard it was like an over the top Rome. I thought Rome was well done on HBO. And that basically followed up Gladiator. But you're right. And then Game of Thrones came out and you know we've seen this a lot now. Um, it doesn't feel as fresh as what we got in 2000, which I think works against the overall reach of this movie, because for a lot of audiences that maybe don't have that emotional connection to the first one, cause they didn't live through it coming out and becoming this huge thing with a 
once again, an unfinished script. They go to set with an unfinished script and they absolutely knock it out of the park and it becomes a best picture winner. You don't see that type of stuff happening. But now I feel like the audience is a little numb to some of the parlor tricks the movie can produce, such as that those acts of violence that don't feel like they hit as much as what we see every Sunday night on an HBO type series. Yeah. And I think it's forced when you look at, Hey, how can we recreate scenes in the Coliseum that are, that are really going to jump and be so different, but you know, as brutal at the same time, you know, from the baboons to the rhino, to the sharks, yeah. and we've got to find another way to do this. I mean, originally, like I had no idea this is back before spoilers in 2000. And when you've got, uh, Maximus on like his third or fourth time in the Coliseum and they bring back this old gladiator mm -hmm. that had never lost, obviously. And when these tigers are jumping out of these, these trap doors, you're like, Holy hell. Right. Like I've never seen anything like that. You were kind of prepared for, you know, whatever it was, whether you thought it was hokey or not. I don't think this thing is a misfire, but I just don't think its ceiling is nearly as high as what we saw in 2000. And it's impossible. I don't care who you are. It's impossible not to compare this movie to what we got from the Russell Crowe gladiator. I mean, the fact that it is a direct sequel already ties it in, but the fact that there's very few things that we can see that now surprise us and shock us the way we did maybe in the millennium when that movie came out and became sort of a cultural phenomenon. Well, it's, it's hard to come across a special movie now. It is. And, you know, going back, I think it was the late Richard Harris who said it afterwards, or it was somebody that was linked closely to Ridley Scott. After watching the premiere, they were like, this movie's going to win Oscar for best picture. And, and how often can you get that now, either that early on, but I think it was that, um, it was that unique. It was that well done. And it was just something we'd never seen. Absolutely. It's got such an awards history and pedigree to it that if gladiator two doesn't even get nominated for best picture, then it goes to show that once again, it just couldn't reach its full potential as what we saw there in the two thousands when cinema and the business itself was so very different. Tyler, final thoughts on Gladiator 2. Anything you want to get off your chest about this film experience that has a budget that was out of this world in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars? Um, I think it's a great movie if you stop trying to compare it to one of the greatest movies of the 2000s. Um, I, I wasn't a fan of the villains in this. I thought Walking Phoenix was much more intimidating as Commodus. Um, you, and you are missing that uh, that Russell Crowe performance, as well as the the level of dialogue and writing that was in the original. I really wanted a uh, a, a Paul Mescal to have a moment where he walks in and has that "I am Maximus" sort of moment, but he just didn't. And I think that's what this movie's really missing because it felt like a good movie the whole way through, but it's missing those performances, those moments to make it an all-timer and put it up there with the original Gladiator. Final grade out of five? Uh, four. Four out of five. I still so, think it's a great movie. Still very solid. I'll, I'll go next. I think that this movie works best when it's a war movie. That's when I think it actually works best. It is so effective as a war movie compared to what we see there in the Coliseum. And I think this thing's a three and a half out of five because visually I really felt grounded in this world again. I do feel like there's so much practicality that when you do have a CGI baboon or a CGI rhino or a CGI, the rhino I think actually looked pretty cool, uh, but the sharks, I do feel like it was trying to win over the audience with more of the eccentric, what can we get away with compared to that original that did feel so grounded in just that battle of good versus evil. Three and a half out of five for me after first viewing, and we'll see if I revisit it. But I don't have really the the yearning to go back and watch this thing again. What's your final grade out of five and final thoughts on Gladiator 2? Did it live up to the bars that you set for it? Uh, about, like, uh, I want to go back to something Tyler said. Like, everybody wants to compare it to the original, and that's one of the problems. This is an impossibility. But if this movie was on its own without an original Gladiator, I think we'd be like, damn, that was pretty good. Um, but because we're going to compare it to the original, I don't think it necessarily hits. I wonder, Paul Mescal, you know, a guy that's been nominated for an Academy Award, does he become a leading man? Does, does, I mean, Russell Crowe absolutely exploded 
after that. And he had been in some really good stuff before, like Romper Stomper. A lot of people didn't realize who, you know, uh, L.A. Confidential. He had some really good roles before that. But once he became Maximus, I mean, he exploded. I don't know if Mezcal's got that star power. That is going to be something that's stamped on him of can he reach those heights that russell crowe reached russell crowe was already an oscar nominee before he won yep. for gladiator what's your final grade out of five i'm going to put you to a number yeah, i would go four four out of five i would go four again i thought it was good i would recommend it to gladiator fans look just don't expect that you're going to get the original it's impossible though yeah it's impossible to say that yeah, like how much they intentionally and i tell you this i wish they would have cast somebody else for denzel's role Ooh. I just, I just wish they would have made the role a little bit different. Yeah, well, yeah. I wish they would have made the role different too, but because it was Denzel and because of the way it went. Took that, you out of it? That was really the focus yeah. of the entire movie. The whole second half. The second half, yeah. It, it really turns into a Denzel vehicle, and I was not wanting that. I, I love Denzel as that sort of secondary piece. There's a line he says in the movie when he comes to discussing how he chooses gladiators. He says, some choose entertainers, some choose brute force. I choose rage. That was my favorite line from the movie. And I loved the idea that he was pulling the strings. But then I But then he becomes the main antagonist. I then, didn't like it. Then I thought following up, the only problem was when Connie Nielsen goes to, and again, not to give too much away, to the Paul Mescal character. And then it's all rage with him. And it's like, I don't know. There was some a lot of predictability in the movie. Absolutely. I, I didn't like how uh he pretends to not know who he is. Uh, uh, for like 30 seconds, but then you see him talking to every other side character about, it's like, yeah, I used to grow up here. Yeah, I used to read that when I was here. I used to have this teacher and that teacher. I used to do this. It's I also, when he was going through the grieving process in the ocean where he's pulling the arrow out of the love of his life, I thought that was really good, only to be undone two minutes later when he's cracking jokes on the boat about, wait, well, right. to stay alive. And, I, and I'm like, oh, this is such a, no. Make like this that guy would still be in shock. Like, yeah. People still feel Russell Crowe's pain from the original Gladiator of losing his family. Yeah, he's supposed to carry the entire movie and for the rest of his life. They undid greatness in two minutes, and I was frustrated as a viewer going, no, you just you just made me detach from this guy. When I was the chick that took the arrow? I don't, I don't know her name. I didn't know her name either. I don't know her name. Uh, I forget the name. Yeah. 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 And I heard, so another thing that, that Jack, my, my son, leaned over, and he's like, Eddie from Stranger Things is in this. That yep. is correct. Yeah, he played the main emperor guy. Okay, so he was one of the blonde hair guys? Correct. Okay. Well, yeah. that's a change in look. And he'll be in Fantastic Four coming out in July of 2025. So he his he's on the rise for sure. Will we see a Gladiator 3? If you had to bet right now, based on the budget going out of control for this one, based on the fact that they're trying to get the ball back in the air, I know it's all about how this one performs worldwide. But if you had to bet on it right now, do we see Gladiator 3 within the next five years? Well, you would have to because Ridley Scott might, might not make it another five years. And again, it is incredible that he's 86 years old. Um, I think we will know this in the next couple of months on what these box office returns are, but based on how it's like, we've lost a lot of creativity. Yeah. It, let's just repackage this as a franchise. Yeah. I think we will. If this movie had come out in 2010, 2008, it would have just absolutely slayed living in a post game of Thrones world. I think hurts gladiator Two just a little bit. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I mean, I'm shocked. It took basically 25 years for this thing to come out absolutely i think that that is something that works against the ceiling of the film hey you can't bet on gladiator fights but you can bet on everything else anytime anywhere with mybookie.ag make sure you use that promo code next round so that way you go ahead and get Everything to reach your potential there is you have daily odds boosts, same game parlays, and super contests. Bet and play absolutely anything, anytime, anywhere, only with my bookie. Lance, thank you so much for your time. Always and, fun, uh, man. I hope we can get back talking some more movies here very soon. I, I love the passion uh, for, for, for film here, for TV. Um, I was trying to tell somebody the other day that, that Tyler, I brought up, hey, man, you, you know, give us your take on gladiator two you saw it last night i didn't see it last night i saw wicked i saw it on monday and i tried to tell him i was like i think he saw over 100 movies in the theater this year i'm at 110 now are you close this year no, i'm half of that okay uh, i have a family that yeah, yeah, yeah. requires some yeah, enjoy I, I, I have no single. family or social life or friends that's okay buddy <laughs> all right well he has you the loyal meltdonians here that populate the channel and we really appreciate your support make sure you like and subscribe